Welcome to Restaurant Influencers presented by Entrepreneur Media. My name is Sean Walcha, founder of Cali Barbecue and Cali Barbecue Media. In life, in the restaurant business, and in the new creator economy, we learn through lessons and stories. We couldn't be more appreciative for Toast, our title sponsor, for believing in this pro project, believing in this show. Uh, it's so important for restaurant owners to think differently in this new economy in 2022 and beyond, using your smartphone to become media companies, being content creators, putting becoming e-commerce businesses. We are looking for the greatest storytellers on the internet, the greatest people in hospitality, and we have one of them today. It is Daniel Stoller of at Square Pie Guys. They have 55,000 followers on Instagram. They have 3,000 followers on TikTok. I have huge hopes for them with TikTok. I think they're going to be uh, breaking millions of followers. If they keep doing the content that they that they put on Instagram, uh, go follow them at Square Pie Guys, and I guarantee you, you will get hungry for Detroit-style pizza. Daniel, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Super fired up to have you, man. Um, we're going to start off with my favorite random question, which is where in the world is your favorite stadium, stage, or venue? Ooh, that's a great question. I would say it's a, it's highly temporary, but there's a barbecue competition in New Orleans called Hogs for the Cause. Okay. And the stage there on the last night, if you spent the you know 24 hours awake, maybe drinking bourbon, maybe cooking a little bit of barbecue. When the sun's going down and the bluegrass is playing, it's probably one of the most special places in the world. So hogs for the cause. We're going to go there. Um, we're going to put on the barbecue contest because, as you know, we love barbecue. Um, but we're also going to invite people that listen to this show, people that are in the restaurant business, the hospitality business, content creators, people like we like to say that are playing the game within the game. We're going to put you on center stage and give you two minutes to give us the square guy, square pie guys elevator pitch. Who are you? What do you do? Who is square pie guys? Go. We are the next great American pizza chain. We're Domino's for our generation. Um, yes. We started as a pop-up in 2018 and pretty quickly started selling out. And ever since then, our goal has been to make incredible food and make the lives of our team better while we do it. That is incredible. So we, we teach restaurant owners, people that listen to this show, how important it is as entrepreneurs to have an elevator pitch. It's funny when you think about being an entrepreneur, the shows for entrepreneur, we're grateful that it's reached millions of people since we launched in January of this year. And it's funny that in real life, we're really good at telling our story. We're really good at telling our business partner, hey, I got this crazy idea. We're really good at telling our significant others, our spouses, hey, I'm crazy. I should open up this, this pizza joint, this pop-up that turns into a restaurant. Yet when it comes to telling our story online to the internet, to the smartphone, to YouTube, to Instagram, to TikTok, we don't, it's very difficult for us to do. You did a phenomenal job. So thank you for kicking off the show in such a great way. Bring me back to the pop-up, bring me back to the crazy idea when you guys were, were your, you and your business partner, Mark, were pitching each other on, on, on launching this thing. Yeah. So, uh, you know, pre COVID my now fiance and I used to have these like awesome 4th of July parties. And I think Probably one of the best ones, Mark actually brought a pizza oven, like a portable pizza oven. One of our buddies brought some barbecue. Wasn't Sean, but you're invited next year. <laughs> I appreciate Come it. On, drive, on, drive on up. And uh, it was just a good time. I mean, it was it was the type of party that, you know, someone made out with someone that they weren't married to. It was like a lot of fun. <laughs> and I distinctly remember I was doing a pizza project. I was working as a consultant at the time. And my business now business partner was throwing around pie into the oven. He had a pop-up going and he was like, dude, I think Detroit style pizza needs to come to the West coast. And having just done all of the work I'd done and all the research, it was kind of like, yeah, like there was not really a pitch. He was like, this is a good idea. And I was like, yes, you are correct. That is a good idea. Let's fucking do it. Um, so we did a couple bike rides, tried some of the pizza in the East Bay where we both live. So in, in the Bay area, Oakland is part of what's called the East Bay. It's East of the, San Francisco Bay and I uh, couldn't find any really good amazing pizza and you know we had some good beer and got some exercise and we decided to take Mark's pop-up that was doing round pizzas and, and start making some square pies and I think our second night we sold out um, bought more pans kept selling out and it was just kind of like well we knew we wanted to open a restaurant and the traction was there so we just we just kept going that's insane so the, the big idea is going from a, a circle to a square 
but going all in, going all in on the ingredients, chef driven, you know, quality, what else? I mean, I think that's a big thing, but the other thing was, you know, you can make pizza as the same way you can make barbecue where it's like you are a slave to the oven, you're a slave to the mixer, you're stuck there every single day, or you can build an organization where you create this environment of excellence and allow everyone else to be part of that. So like we wanted to start a restaurant, but we didn't necessarily want to start a restaurant where the two guys that you see behind me, I'm the, the one with a hat and the logo, were there every single day making the pizza. Like we wanted to create a scalable brand and a concept. So what was amazing was we were doing this pop-up and we got all this credit for the hard work we were doing. I think a lot of it was right time, right place. But, you know, like at, I think one month we were doing a Thursday, Friday night pop-up while we still had our jobs. And I think in addition to that, we did five or six other pop-ups during the weekend. So we'd be like packing U-Haul trucks Saturday, Sunday, showing up at bars. Like we really were busting our asses. And the whole goal always was to open a restaurant and to do it in a way that kind of reflected the learnings I had at 12 years in the industry, what to do, what not to do, you know, how to be a better employer, because I left. Like when I was 26, I had been a sous chef at a fine dining restaurant in Seattle ended up leaving it due to a relationship I was in, wound up at a job that I love the food. It just wasn't what I wanted to be doing. And I was miserable. And I was like, restaurants aren't for me anymore. Like the goal of opening a restaurant before I'm 30 and getting a James Beard just doesn't sit with what I yeah. want to do. I want to have fun again, you know? So I left the industry. Hours were bad. The pay was bad. Joke's on me because four years later, I ended up starting a pop-up. <laughs> Here we are. But, um when I when, when you I have the have, hospitality in your blood, you can't run away from it. It comes back. That's to true. You. And also, like I think it was, I learned that there was a way to do it differently. And I think that was the most important thing was I thought that restaurants could only be run and operated and staff treated a certain way. And I think through some of my experiences, I learned that that doesn't necessarily have to be true. And I think that was what was really important for me. Um, and that wasn't necessarily a perspective that Mark had, like he's more of a career changer and he did some work in restaurants as he was learning the craft, but he didn't have that sort of knowledge or maybe that experience of seeing, you know, a lot of small restaurants, the people are amazing, but there's no leadership management training. And so the people managing it might not know what they're doing from a management perspective. They might be really technically good cooks or really incredible servers, but they don't necessarily know how to manage and lead. And I think, you know, we wanted to, to try to figure out how to, to fix that. And now a quick break from Restaurant Influencers to welcome our newest sponsor to the show, and that is Davo Sales Tax. Davo is an incredible company. I remember when we first opened up our restaurant in 2008, Cali Barbecue, we were struggling to figure out how to automate sales tax, how to have enough money in our account to file our quarterly taxes. I am so grateful that now Today, we have found Davo and they are a sponsor of the show and they are excited to help other business owners no longer have to become tax collectors. Davo does it all for you. They take care of the compliance. They take care of the collecting. They take care of the filing. Get your first month free by going to davosalestax.com slash influencers. Let them know that we sent you. Davo is an incredible company. We're grateful to have them on the show. They integrate with all the top POS companies, including Toast. DavoSalesTax.com slash influencers. Automate your sales tax today and get back to running your business. Yeah, I think that's what you're talking about is so important to the conversations that we have every week on this show. And what we hope to help restaurant owners is that we have to think bigger than just opening up the restaurant. Like we have to think of ourselves as, as a food business, as a tech business, as a media business. And the more that we think about that, the more it forces us to be uncomfortable, have uncomfortable conversations that typically haven't been had in a lot of mom and pop restaurants. A lot of the times you spend so much time just trying to get the doors open. Once you get the doors open, you try to figure out how to pay payroll. Once you try to figure out payroll, it's like, how do we get more people in seats? But it's like this endless loop and this endless cycle that doesn't allow you to think bigger. You know, when you start talking about culture, you know, just the way that you and Mark were having conversations, it was always bigger than 
you guys cooking the pizza. And I think it's a great point for a lot of the, you know, in our craft and the barbecue craft, I never, I, I'm not the, I'm not the pit master. And thankfully I never had no one in San Diego or no one who's tried our barbecue had to rely on me cooking the barbecue. It was always, how do we as a company grow and how do we build a culture from the beginning? That is a place where we can think differently. How do you guys build culture in and how do you think about it now? How many employees do you have? We're right about a hundred. A uh, hundred. So exactly. how many, how many stores? We have three stores. We just opened our third one in. Uh, Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, it was a fun summer for sure. Um, and I, you know, I've I been trying to day. get this guy on the show all summer and he's like, just too, too busy. With all the, uh, well, too busy yeah. running then, the business. <laughs> I would say I've been busy running the business, but also we're so fortunate. I mean, Mark and I both spent two weeks in Europe this past, uh, in Good September. Um, I was already engaged, so no one asked if I got engagement. Everyone asked him if he was going to get engaged. I guess it didn't happen. So um, I, I think for me, like the culture really starts with understanding what makes the team happy or what they need. And, you know, there's there's always a level of we have to run a business. So we're very clear up front sort of what the expectations are. Um, but one of the worst things that ever happened to me in restaurants, and it happened a lot, was, you know, you come into a restaurant, you've been to culinary school, and, you know, people that go to culinary school sometimes have a reputation for thinking they know more than they do, <laughs> probably fell into that category a little bit. But, you know, it's like something like, hey, go make me an aioli. And you're like, okay, I'll go make this aioli. It's a, you know, mayonnaise with garlic, you know, measure out mayo, mix it up, taste delicious, bring it to the chef. And the chef goes, what is, this is terrible. W what did you make me? They didn't give me a recipe. They just told me to make an aioli. Yeah. And I failed. But at that time, I didn't realize that they were actually failing me as a leader. Because if they had a very clear expectation and idea of what the aioli should taste like, to give me the tools to succeed instead of setting me up for failure to then shame me for doing it yes. wrong. Um, and I think that's a big piece of it. So from day one, it was like, if we're going to hand off recipes, we're going to hand off recipes. If we're going to have dialed dough procedures and we have this sort of phrase that I try to use, which is like, when there's an issue with someone, you know, a job someone's done, my question is, is it systemic or is it performance? If it's performance, discipline is 100% necessary. If it's systemic, we need to take this as a learning and figure out how to incorporate that learning. So like, for instance, we built a new walk-in in our first location. It's huge. It runs way colder than the other ones, not overstuffed. It's like under capacity for the first time in our history. We've ever had a fridge that is under capacity. We're yeah. so lucky to say that. And the pizza wasn't cooking right because our recipe was based on this walk-in that ran on the higher end of acceptable temperatures. And so the dough wasn't proofing at the same speed. And it's like, this GM's messing up. They're putting out bad food. And I'm like, well, have we looked at what's different? Yeah. Like, what is wrong with the recipe? And it turned out their walk-in was running really cold and the dough wasn't proofing right. And it also taught us that we need to do a better job of creating that level of mastery and knowledge. But at no point was anyone like, we're going to, we're going to fire it. Like, let's write this guy up. This guy's messing up. And it was like, what have we done to fail them and, and, and support? And I think that simple sort of perspective shift has bought us so much trust with our team, at least from my perspective. Sure. Um, and the other thing is like, we have four values and the first one is team first. And it doesn't mean that we don't pay attention to the PL. It doesn't mean that we're not, you know, hawks when it comes to bookkeeping and accounting, but like when we make decisions, we really consider the impact it might have on the team. Um, another example I'll give, and I also love, by the way, Sean, that you're so focused on not just where we've been, but where we're going. So thanks for letting yes. me talk about this. Of course. So we just opened our third store and, you know, in the first two months of that, we saw a cannibalization of our, of our first store, right? We probably should have expected it, but we had these sales projections built and then sales in the first store went down. It was also, you know, the first summer truly after COVID in San Francisco and San Francisco historically empties out. People go on these massive vacations, myself included, um, and sales were down in this sort of downtown store. And, you know, it really made us look at, okay, what's our corporate overhead? How's the cash flow? And we, you know, we asked one of, we, we laid someone off and on, on the corporate team because we just were like, well, we don't see quite how this role fits anymore. And there's another person who's been with us for a long time. And I feel an immense amount of loyalty to them. And it was like, well, it seems like this is what we need to do economically. And we've been fortunate, you know, we, we tightened some things up, sales are back up. And so the conversation is different. But for me, it was not just like, 
the economics. It was like, how does this affect this person who has literally destroyed themselves for us at so many different kind of, you know, we had these big needs and they filled these holes, but they've built basically every team in our stores. Yeah. How does that affect our team if we let go of them because we're kind of in a different place as a business? And I think saving that role, finding a new way to, to approach it, to me was, that's what my last week was. That's what I was sitting down trying to figure out. I was like, how do we make this work? And I'm, I'm happy to say that we did. And, you know, it's never fun to lose anyone, but I'm, I'm glad we really didn't lose this person. So, well, I appreciate the, the openness and honesty. I think it's something that always, you know, we're fortunate now to have this platform with entrepreneur with so many people tuning in and it's easy to focus on the successes as brands scale. You know, if you're a single unit restaurant owner listening to this and you're thinking about opening your next location, it's not always easy. It's not always successful. I mean, a lot of times there's a lot of failures that you learn opening the second, third, fourth store. And each of those, you know, I think that's the power of what I've seen with Toast and, you know, this customer advisory board. This is how you and I met. We're part of this customer advisory board. We've had fellow um, people on this show as well. But when you get to talk to other people that are in the weeds, <laughs> that are doing, that are experiencing the same stress that you are, the same fears and the same anxieties, you feel more open to talk to other leaders because as entrepreneurs, I mean, we like to think that we're on an island, even though, you know, on the show, we talk about stay curious, get involved, ask for help. Asking for help is hard. Asking for help means that you have to be vulnerable, you know, and for you to be vulnerable on the show, I really appreciate that. What would you say to people, other restaurant owners that don't have a group like this customer advisory board that Toast has? How, how, how did you, you know, grow as a restaurant owner? I mean, I think podcasts are a huge part of it. I'm, I'm so I'm like famously a, a college dropout. Um, and I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm uneducated because I spent every free moment I had as a cook reading every cookbook. I mean, my fiance and I have a, like a low, low, low level fight about what we're going to do with all of my cookbooks because they just keep filling. <laughs> like I can't not buy more books and I can't get rid of the <laughs> books that I have. So it's like, you know, catching the rye goes in the rubbish pile, but we're not getting rid of that esoteric book about literally I have a book that's like from a church in Minnesota and it's all Campbell's chicken. Like every single recipe, I feel like including desserts is like Campbell's chicken noodle soup is the base of it never never get over my dead hands um but so like consumption of media has been huge for me and i think listening to aspirational podcasts looking outside of our industry i mean yep. i think how i built this for me stopped being relevant at some point because it, i felt like maybe the stories were less scrappy I mean, they're all inspirational but i really like you know lara bar she was like a single mom and she was in a really hard place and she had to invent this bar literally using like a cuisinart home food processor like that type of story is so inspirational to me. Yep. Um, and just hearing how people have built things together. Um, but the other thing is like, just, I think you have to find your community. So like one thing I'm, maybe I go too much on this, but like, as I've kind of met other folks in leadership roles in and outside of my industry, you know, we'll go get drinks. And, uh, you know, we did a collaboration with probably one of the most well-respected restaurateurs uh, in San Francisco. This guy, Charles uh, Belilis, who owns uh, this company called Suvla, and they're fast fine. They coined the term. Um, they do, you know, basically five or six menu items based on Greek souvlaki. His like parents are first generation Greek, and he's just trying to rewrite that sort of immigrant restaurant experience. And he makes beautiful restaurants that have like pretty dialed operations, and they just kill it. And the it's all there. And we did a collaboration with him and, you know, afterwards we just started getting drinks and that's been so rewarding because you get to sort of have that person to talk to. So I, I guess I would say like reaching out, you know, like sometimes I've DM'd people on Instagram. I've, I've sent cold emails. Like, you know, I ate at a restaurant around the corner from the Ghirardelli store and I really liked it. I emailed them. I was like, Hey, that was awesome. Like, let's stay in touch. And sometimes you get it back and sometimes people are like, yeah, you know, whatever, but you know, you got to put yourself out there. Um, so yeah, I would say just say like reaching out and, you know, podcasts are huge. Books are huge. Um, and yeah, I think that's, that would be my advice. 
one of the coolest things I've seen, um, what you guys do on social and what you do on digital is collaborations. Can you talk about the collaborations that you've done recently and uh, why it's so important for your brand and for any brand that's listening? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it was really cool how the first one ever happened, which is at our pop up, we were down the street from KMEL, which is our 106 one. So kind of like hip hop, R&B top, like Billboard top 40. And Big Vaughn is one of the radio personalities and Big Vaughn would come to our pop-up and our pizza at the time called the Mean Green Sausage Machine is broccoli, white sauce, chili flake, spicy honey. That's the essence of it. And Big Vaughn would come in and at the pop-up, the bar that we hosted it at, they did our front of house and we cooked. And he would order the Mean Green, take the broccoli off, add pepperoni which is a delicious pizza. It's also the one vegetable on the pie. He took it off. Um, <laughs> like, he'd like get like two for himself. And so we opened the restaurant. We just put that on the menu. Like, well, we got to have the big bond. And, you know, it was cool because now we just won this kind of favor with this guy who was an early supporter and has a, a big network. Um, and the next one was that Jeremy Lin who's like a, a basketball star grew up in Palo Alto, went to Harvard. Lin Sanity, baby. Yeah, and then he played for the NBA. Um, huge Bay Area following. He would come in and he would order pizzas. And then one day he started asking for special modifications, which we famously don't allow. But uh, our GM was a huge <laughs> fan, so they were getting we famously the don't allow modifications unless it's a collaboration. Unless, unless you're, yeah, I'm sorry to all of our guests. That sounds terrible. For what it's worth, if I had been asked, I would have said even he does not get a modification. But fortunately, I was not because it turned out pretty well. Um, and eventually, we decided yeah. to pitch him on, you know, a charity focused kind of collaboration. And we did this really awesome tasting. And we had three pizzas, one which was like more in line with what he described. And we had one that was kind of in the middle. And then we had one that was, you know, we used the term hypothesis, but it was like, our existing ingredients, we thought it would taste really good and it'd be a lot easier to operate, you know, to execute operationally. And so there's a little bit of this management of like, we don't really want shrimp on a pizza ever, but you're, you know, this opportunity. I, I'm laughing. I'm sorry. I'm laughing because from the operational side to the marketing side, this is literally like, this is the microcosm of all the problems that happen. This is what marketers want to do. And this is what operations are like. We can't do this. We, we can do this one time thing, but operationally it's going to be a pain in the ass to do. But I think what's really cool, and the way I, the way I talk about innovation in our company is actually having your cake and eating it too. So like I've always talked about, there's like a three-legged stool of like good, fast and cheap. Yep. And you're supposed to pick two. I'm like, no, let's pick all three. Like, that's really how I, I would like us to approach things. And that's how we try to do it. Anyways, thankfully, he chose a pie that was easier to execute. It ended up being a top seller. And what we learned and the, the hypothesis the, was the top seller or the, yeah. the yeah. hypothesis, hypothesis was, wow, amazing. Of closest in. And there was a little bit of management, but really, like, that was the better tasting pie because it turns out, even if you're an amazing basketball player, maybe your palate isn't <laughs> quite where. Cut that. Strike. It. Cut that. We're not editing that. That's, oh, we're sending that. We're tagging Jeremy. Yeah, we're definitely tagging up. Jeremy. Oh my god! Great. Sorry, Jeremy Lynn. Um, it's fine. Jeremy's. He has so, tough skin. If you played in New York, he has tough skin. He can handle it. That's true. That's true. <laughs> uh, so that pie ended up being. So famously, we sell six by eight. That's our pepperoni pizza. It's called a six by eight because we literally count out six rows of eight pepperoni. It started, this, this is the funny thing. It's like, that was an operational hack that we made a marketing term. And now yes. it's like it, it, the six by eight is the pepperoni pizza because there's 48 pepperoni. And it's, it's iconic, right? Yes. It's a layer. You see all the pools agree. It's great. And it tastes really good. And it's our top seller. Um, and then it's the big bond. And then when Jay Lynn was on the menu, Jay Lynn was like sometimes second and sometimes third on the sales mix. So it was like, that's awesome. Like this is killing it. Yes. Uh, and the press outreach was amazing. So the, my really, really long answer was what we learned was we could do something good because we can donate some money to charity. We can collaborate with someone that people on our team and outside are going to be really inspired and excited by. And by doing so, we expand our network. So, you know, we're very fortunate. We, in the early days, one of my best friends worked at a PR firm. So our first store had a PR launch and we learned a lot from that. And it was, it was not as expensive as people think, but having that sort of press training has been 
such a boon for us. And it really sets up a trajectory as long as you're ready for that hype. Um, but the other thing is that it sort of expanded our network. So like, whereas we could email Eater when new menu items came out and they yes. might do a little blurb, they're like, can we talk to Jeremy? Like, can we get the, like, it was like, it sort of exploded what people were willing to talk about for Square Pie Guys. And when we got Samin Nasrat, who in some circles is probably even a bigger star than Jeremy Lit, especially in the Bay Area foodie circle, she did a Netflix show called Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat, has a cookbook of the same name. She worked for Chez Panisse, but, you know, she's not what normal food personalities probably like, she's not like a white dude. Like she's like a person of color. She's like, like unapologetically kind of like not a mess, but like, she's not, she intentionally wants you to see how much she enjoys the food she's eating and cooking. And she's passionate. And like, yep. you know, she would probably only cook meat on the bone ever. Like she's just like this fucking, and she's super cool in person. She's so warm anyways. So when we did that, that collaboration with her, it was a similar effect. Whereas like Oakland saw it's, I won't say numbers, but like Oakland, when it opened, destroyed sales projections. And then it came to somewhere basically in between this crazy number and where we thought it would be. So we're like really happy with it. When the Samin pie came out, it spiked back up to that first week of like, oh shit, this store is not big enough yeah. for this volume. And it was, it was super rewarding. Um, and so now it's just kind of become this cornerstone where if we find collaborators that we find exciting or inspirational and we think our guests will enjoy them and they express any modicum of interest in our brand, we're like, well, how do we, how do we convince them to think we're cool? That's amazing. Um, and it, it's fun. And so like Mark, my business partner probably spends like a lot of his time when we get those Instagram reposts by the blue check. It's like, yep. is that someone that would potentially work with us? Like, how do we make ourselves attractive to them? Um, turns out getting your own pizza on the menu in a restaurant that doesn't offer modifications can sometimes be its own uh, motivating factor. <laughs> and now a quick break from restaurant influencers to share an exciting new offer from our sponsor, Atmosphere TV. Go to atmosphere.tv forward slash BBQ to not only get Atmosphere TV for free, but also our audience is given the gift of $200 in ad credits, as well as free activation. Join more than 40,000 other venues who use Atmosphere TV by signing up with the code BBQ at atmosphere.tv forward slash BBQ. Keep guests entertained with Atmosphere TV because you have the ability to turn your promotions and your advertisements onto your television with this platform. The simple plug and play device lets you take control of the content on your screens. Keep guests entertained, engaged, and informed of real-time specials, career opportunities, and announcements that you can personalize within your own custom content dashboard. Tap into great channels such as America's Funniest Home Videos, Fashion, Throttle, Chive TV, Sports Highlights, Red Bull, Real Madrid, along with unbiased news and entertainment. There is something for everyone. Over 60 curated channels of short form, entertaining content to choose from right at your fingertips. They also have an incredible ad supported network that allows you to not only market within your four walls, but also locally or nationally if you desire. The platform gives you full control to dial in your marketing efforts. Please go and visit atmosphere.tv slash BBQ and let them know restaurant influencers sent you. It's absolutely incredible. I, I love the story. I mean, we we've done the similar things here at our barbecue restaurant when we partnered with sports radio back in the day and we named a sandwich, the Chris Ello pulled pork sandwich and it won an award. It was on the cover of the San Diego Union Tribune, our only paper here, but it was such a big deal for him that he was talking about it on the radio. This is, you know, I talk about influence and the original influencers were people before social media, you know, before the internet age, it was people on radio, people on television, mm -hmm. writers, it was, those were the people and they still are. It's so many different people and it's a different way to look at things. I mean, I love the fact that you guys are doing things with Jeremy Lynn, doing things with Samin, Melissa King, that you guys did mm -hmm. the top chef winner, you know, can you, 
you said the PR part, and I think that's something I don't talk a lot about on the show, but now that we're on entrepreneur, I'm starting to get a lot of PR companies that are working, reaching out to us to have their clients on the show. And I've always talked shit earlier on because we were in a bad location. I learned I had to do PR for myself. So I always yeah. had this bad taste in my mouth about what PR firms could do for independent restaurant owners that they were charging them too much. But now I think there's a different way that I'm looking at it. And there are things that PR companies can do if they're very strategic. Can you give me the playbook kind of like the pie guys? What did you learn about PR? Cause you said a couple blurbs that I really want to highlight for someone that's listening that can go, Hey, I've never thought about emailing eater. I never thought that my story was relevant enough because these things are relevant. Yeah. I mean, I, to, to jump off that and then I'll kind of give you some of the higher level earnings. Like it doesn't hurt to keep the press in the loop. So yep. every food journalist in your city you can find their email address. It's probably usually just their first name at their domain.com. But if not, if you look up a journalist on Eater, like you can see the editor's email address. If you yep. look up any food writer at your local paper, same thing. Um, and you know, as you start getting inbound leads, if that happens, you save those emails and you just put them on a list. So yep. depending on what you're doing and how often, you know, every time we do a new menu, we'll do a press release. And sometimes it gets no traction. And sometimes it gets a lot of traction. Um, but to back up, so the, what the PR company helped us do, and I think this is particularly important for restaurants that haven't opened yet, or folks that are opening new locations is they gave us a playbook for the opening of the first location and really every location after that. And what I mean by that is that there is a timeline under which you basically want to operate to maximize press coverage and to like, make sure that those conversations that you're having are exciting that you would never ever know yep. if you were not taught it. And for yep. us, it was a timeline starts about a month out. And I remember that, you know, we had engaged this company, you know, we, when we announced the location, because when, when you sign a location, people figure it out when you apply for a change of liquor license, either, you know, people are literally paid on their staff to look at those, those postings. And when they reach out, you better be ready to give them enough details to get the press, but not so much they're not going to come back before you open and write a bigger story. So there's yeah. there's the strategy right in and of itself. The second liquor license postings happen, someone's going to figure it out and someone's going to reach out and someone's going to write about it. So you better control that and you have, have something. But once that you're that month out, the way we look at it is we try not to do it till we have a permit to operate because... Um, it's stressful to not be ready to open a restaurant and <laughs> try to be opening it. Wait, um, are you are you telling me you don't open when you say you're going to open? <laughs> actually, uh, did you not? Really. We no, basically, you did. We basically have opened with our on our original date for. That's all amazing! Stores. Congratulations. We pushed Ghirardelli back, and then we brought it back up. <laughs> okay. So, there you go. Uh, yeah. So it was. It's been. Uh, it's been a good learning. Um, you know, we're also very scrappy. So like we did raise some like friends and family for our first restaurant, but we haven't raised any cash since then. So everything awesome. since then has been us managing cash flow. Um, it's been stressful. It's been hard. And I think part of the reason I have some semblance of an elevator pitch ready is that we're thinking about potentially going for additional capital at some point. But, um, you know, so that month out, you you have a month. So, you know, you get your permit to operate or you, you assume that you will. You do a press photo shoot. So you make the restaurant look like it's ready to go. Make sure it's beautiful. You bring in food, you bring in the team, you make food, people in the space, all that stuff. It takes a couple of days to turn that around. And then you put together your press kit. And so now you're three, maybe two and a half weeks out. And now if you're in San Francisco, every, every media outlet is important. Yes. But in San Francisco, it's the Chronicle and Eater. And they're two different guest types entirely. The Chronicle is tends to be on the older side. They, they read the physical paper. They subscribe to the E, you know, sfchronicle.com. You want them because they're higher spend. And there's a lot of people in San Francisco that are at a place in their life and their careers where they're going to go try new restaurants, if yep. only to be part of the conversation. Yep. And then... You have probably more of like the millennial Gen Z and the Eater Instagram sort of news cycle is incredibly important to them. And in some ways, Eater has a much bigger reach, even though it's only on the internet, than as the Chronicle does. So you want both. And they don't want you to have both. Both of them only want you to choose them. 
And so you get sort of playing this game of chess where you're, if it's you or it's your PR firm, you're negotiating what exclusive content one can get versus the other. So with Ghirardelli Square, one of the things we got from the Chronicle was that Ghirardelli Square, if you don't know, is, is a pretty touristy place. Yep. And the developer that owns Ghirardelli Square has been trying to reclaim it for locals. That's like part of why we did this project was it was exciting to be part of a transformation. Also doesn't hurt that it's a beautiful space that looks out on the water and there is some like cool economic features and it's a great delivery location. But like Chronicle wanted to us to go on record saying why it wasn't weird that we were opening in Ghirardelli Square, which is like a pretty specific feature. Yes. But like they, that was part of the negotiation. So like, okay, we'll do that. Um, and so what basically all that being said is like, if you handle this negotiation correctly, what you have is the day you open or the day before you open, both the paper of record in your city and Eater put something out there. And so what happens is when we open Square Pie Guys, the first one, we open at 4.30 and at 3.45, Carolyn, this woman who was our PR person and also like literally one of my best friends, she was like, there's a line outside. And we're like, oh, fuck. <laughs> like, <laughs> I guess that's good. Yes. Um, and we sold 188 pizzas and around seven o'clock, someone was like, there's no more dough in Milwaukee. It was like, okay, so we're sold out. Okay, so that's it. That's it. And also we were planning to do 24 or 48 hour fermentation dough. That doesn't work because we opened tomorrow and we don't have more pizza. <laughs> so, so that was a great, great problem to have. And, yep. you know, I give a lot of credit to that sort of savvy approach to, to press relationship that, you know, a lot of people don't get it. I, actually, my Correct. business partner, I, I only bring this up because I think it's been amazing to see how much he's taken this and like run with it. But like, I was like, oh, Carolyn's going to help us with PR. And he's like, well, wh why do we need that? Like, we're like this like cool, sexy pop-up. And I was like, yep. well, I think that, you know, probably that it can help us even more. And like, you know, they're pretty affordable and like, you know, they're friends. So, yep. uh, and we learned so much and we got such amazing press contacts out of it that it's like, it was such a such a win on our part to have done that that it's just like i would i would never not recommend it the yeah. one one thing though is when you get that hype when you get that press like the guy we took the restaurant over from is a is another restaurant institution and he's like you guys have so much hype right now so like we didn't it, we had all that hype if our first week we had done not as good of a job as we did and there was plenty of things we fucked up like no <laughs> doubt in my mind like we are not the restaurant today that we were then yes or vice versa we at least delivered mostly consistent, delicious food. And so we didn't fall flat. Sorry, my dogs are upset about something. Hey, oh, they're cool. if they want to be on uh, entrepreneur, they're welcome. Honestly, they probably could. They're really good at manipulating me to giving them treats, <laughs> <laughs> like taking them on walks. Uh, uh, yeah. So like, I think it's, you have to find the right size and, you know, there's bigger platforms that I think are, Hey, Uh, sorry, the fun of working from home. Um, the there's bigger there's bigger firms that um, think you should keep this all in. You should We're keeping it all. It. We don't cut it. This should only be yeah. That the way that, that's how people learn how to make their own media. You make your own media by not cutting it out by giving people the behind the third wall. This is how it goes down. That's true. Um. So yeah, so I think PR can be an incredible tool, but it's also making sure you find the right partnership and bigger PR firms, I would say this, and I don't mean to disparage any organization, sometimes they might not be as effective as smaller firms because yeah. from a journalist perspective, they get all these inbound leads. And if you have a PR firm reaching out to you for seven of their clients, you're going to maybe choose one of their clients, if any. Yep. It's like if one PR firm reaches out to you for one client, there's a lot higher ratio of, of sort of them getting likely to get on your show. So yep. um, I would say that we've we've learned that the sort of smaller boutique PR firms tend to do better. But the other thing is, you know, I was fortunate enough that at some point I had a phone call with the now senior editor of the Chronicle. And so I had her cell phone. And when we opened Oakland, she actually it was so random. The restaurant across the street was closing. So all of a sudden everyone, people went to go there and our liquor application had her name on it. And she texted me a picture and she's like, did you forget to tell me something? And I was like, uh, okay, we're in the press. Like, I was like, yes, let's get a phone call going guys. Like we need to, we need to have this ready to go. Um, 
but I think like we we've now taken over some of that relationship management. And again, yeah. like we're fortunate to be able to do that. But if you get that opportunity, don't squander it. Like take advantage of it, build that relationship, send cute things about like if they you like an article they posted, tell yes. them. Keep keep on their build brain. a relationship. Thing is yeah. like you know a, a person you're trying to woo romantically. Like don't be a crazy creepy stalker, but like keep it keep it warm. You know, yeah. and I think a lot of folks in this industry are are good at that. Yeah, no, I'm happy you took the time to to go through that because it's something that we don't talk a lot about, but everybody's a content creator and especially the legacy content creators don't assume that they have seen your post on Facebook or on Instagram or on TikTok or, you know, build those, cultivate those relationships. And if you do need help with PR, there are some incredible people out there that already have those existing relationships and it can really take your brand to the next level. Uh, you said something interesting in your elevator pitch that you square pie guys is, is the dominoes of our generation. What can, what can pizza restaurants learn from dominoes first of all they've built i think an incredible technology stack like the, i think there was the uh, maybe it was 2016 2017 2018 where it was like domino's isn't pizza company it's a technology company and i think that's maybe blurs the sort of reality which is that every company nowadays needs to leverage technology to be better at what it does it doesn't change the essence of what it is like i still don't think that we work was a technology company i think we work was a real estate company that was trying to use technology to do a better job yep. and i think that's exactly what spg is and when we were raising that friends and family round i mean we're in silicon valley so you know, we were getting five thousand ten thousand dollar checks but we were getting them from people that had invested in startups and they're like you got to make it a techie pitch. Like what's your, what's your tech? <laughs> I mean, we certainly built like this ecosystem of technology. We use 27 different software products to operate our business, but that's not what makes us special. What makes us special is we figure out an operational model that can succeed at high volumes and do it in a way where the consistency is incredibly high. And all of that's wrapped into a package that looks really exciting and tastes delicious. And like, that's, I mean, that's, we're not a technology company, but we are definitely technophiles and that's our fourth value is technophilia, which is a really weird way to say it, but I couldn't think of anything else. So <laughs> describe it. Give me the definition of technophilia. It means using technology to make our lives better. I mean, it means that when we opened our restaurant and I wanted to learn our bookkeeping because I didn't want to outsource it. I built a tech ecosystem where invoices got emailed automatically and that got forwarded to an invoice processing platform called Plate IQ that then immediately exported it to our inventory management and to QuickBooks, our bookkeeping software. And when I went and paid bills, it marked that as paid. And, you know, it meant that every week I could run a PL and see how much we'd spend on food, at least as a percentage of sales. Um, you know, we used Gusto for payroll. Unfortunately, we've outgrown that from an enterprise perspective, but, you know, we used the pretty easy off the shelf payroll company that made sure we hit all of our compliance goals and could get people paid fast and easy and onboarded with all the, you know, California, I think we have 10 onboarding documents required in our company right now to sign to like work for us. And, uh, you know, Gusto made that an automatic online platform where it's like, once you get their, them in the system, they're just completing it online and it's, it's stored for you. Um, and then, you know, I think you switched to toast during the pandemic, but yep. we, we started with toast and I actually remember building this tech, this ecosystem around toast because I, you know, coming from the restaurant industry, I was working as a consultant. I worked for a pizza company as a consultant and I was looking for point of sales and toast just seemed like the one that kind of had it figured out. They weren't a legacy company pretending to be new. They didn't have the messiness of some of the other kind of cloud-based point of sales. Um, once I started digging into features and integrations, it was like, okay, well, we can wrap this whole thing around toast and we're good to go. You, you know, as well as I do, that's not quite that simple. Um, <laughs> but to connect back to your, to your conversation, I mean, Domino's to me does an incredible job of getting pizza to people where they are, when they need it. And they do it where I think they've sort of approached what's like the most value. And I think value is a really interesting word. And I think we look at value differently as a, as a country, maybe as a generation. I hate using generational divides, but like, I think there's a re kind of examine it. What does value mean? Does it mean that you want the cheapest food possible? Is it that you want really good quality product for the price that makes like the most sense for that? 
do you want the people making it to be treated fairly? And I think that's what we're trying to re-examine is, um, you know, one of our early pitch decks said, who said chain pizza has to suck, which is kind of an esoteric way to say it, but it's like, as you get bigger, how do you keep all of those beautiful qualities and amazing consistent food and really high quality product, but you know, benefit from scale and benefit from being 10 minutes away from everyone and, you know, being in smaller cities and, and being near you. I think that's the, that's the lofty problem that we're trying to solve. I appreciate that. So every single week on Wednesday and Friday, we do a clubhouse call on the social audio app clubhouse at 10 a.m. Pacific time, 1 p.m. Eastern time. Anybody that's listening to the show, if you want to be featured on entrepreneur, if you think you're a restaurant influencer, if you want to be, if you want to learn the, the basic premise is that we're, we're trying to build a mastermind, a digital playground where people can level up. I mean, we don't have all the answers, but the people that join us in these calls, um, we all are all trying to get better, trying to become media companies, content creators, better at barbecue, better at hospitality, better at restaurants, uh, better at sales. So please come and join us if you're listening to this. We appreciate you guys following the show. Um, we also do a social shout out for people that are supporting the show. Um, it gives me a chance to thank people for coming to Clubhouse. Um, it also gives me a chance to thank people that are on our team. This week's shout out goes to TJ Void. Uh, TJ is our resident writer on Cali Barbecue Media. He's located in Houston. He does an incredible job transcribing these, these interviews that we do, putting them up there on Entrepreneur and on Digital Hospitality, our other show. So TJ, thank you for putting in the grind. Dan, Danny, tell me, uh, give me a shout out. Somebody that you want to feature that doesn't get a that doesn't get much love, that's working behind the scenes. Um, somebody in Square Pie Guys, who do you got for me? Yeah. I got two. Okay, um, let's go. So Entrepreneur, they got it. Alfred who Webster. It? Who is it? Alfred, Web Alfred Webster. Okay. You want me to say it louder? Alfred Webster. There you go. The, you, just so, uh, just so he hears. Absolutely. Yeah, the AGM of our Oakland store. Uh, his GM is on maternity leave, and he has absolutely stepped up to the plate in such an incredible way. And I only bring him up because he had such a lack of self-confidence that we were all like, dude, you're going to be amazing. And he's absolutely crushing it. Um, and then Luke Lewis, who sits in our corporate team, he actually applied for the role he's in. Then the role sort of had stayed filled by the person who was in it that didn't end up going to grad school. So he applied as an hourly, got promoted to shift lead. And when that person eventually left the role, um, which is sort of like project manager, IT oversight, you know, dealing with all the issues with Toast, he asked if he could reapply. And I was like, no, but you can just have the job. Um, and he for our third store took all of the it implementation off of my plate and absolutely Ooh. killed it well there you so, go luke and alfred yeah. congratulations guys uh and tj we appreciate you thank you guys so much for listening to the show um if you want to reach out to me it's at sean p walchef s-h-a-w-n-p-w-a-l-c-h-e-f and that's on all social platforms on linkedin tiktok twitter Facebook, Instagram, reach out to me. Um, we love to build community. We'd love to have you guys join us on Clubhouse. Please follow at Square Pie Guys. If you are in the Bay Area, please go and check out the stores, tag them in the content. Let them know you heard Danny on the show. Um, dude, Danny, we certainly appreciate your leadership, your vulnerability. Um, it's, uh, it's exciting to see what you guys are building. I'm grateful to call you a friend and I can't wait to see what you guys are building. I can't wait to come up and try some of that incredible pizza. Uh, it'll be hard for me not to get pizza for lunch after <laughs> looking, <laughs> looking through all your guys' content. Wait for, for, before I let you go, who's doing, who's posting, who's doing the actual posting on square pie guys. So it's a combination of Mark, the, the hair guy, and, the hair guy. Uh, <laughs> Mark, the hair and, guy, and, you're Danny, the hat guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, there was a funny time when Ali's old boss came in, my fiance, and she was like, he's the hat guy. And Mark was wearing a hat. So Why this guy wear a hat for this interview. Uh, I, my the lighting, it's bad. It makes my face. Look okay, okay, fair, fair, I, got, fair I want everyone to see my receding hairline. <laughs> Anyways, so her boss was talking to Mark about how great of an employee Ali was and how he loved working with her. And he was like, oh, I'm just wearing the hat, but that's Danny over there. Um, anyways. Uh, so, and then Priya, Priya Kane, who also helps with, or sorry, Kane, uh, who helps with all of our menu development. Um, she's the one kind of often posting. So the other day I, 
I don't know if we're going to post it because I don't know if I did a good job of, of making the content, but I made breakfast sandwiches in our pizza oven. Yes. And I just sent her all of the videos of me making these like kind of smash patty breakfast sandwiches awesome. and then she'll collate them into reels and, and put them together. So uh, she is working her butt off for us. Yes. So much. Well, she's doing you. incredible work. And uh, like I said, give them a follow on TikTok. I know you guys are going to be blowing that up. I'm talking millions of followers. It's the, the stuff that you guys have, it's absolutely incredible. Danny, thank you so much for your time. Thank you guys for listening. As always, stay curious, get involved. Don't be afraid to ask for help. And we will catch you guys next week. And a special thank you to our title sponsor, Toast. Toast is the primary technology partner that we use at our restaurant, Cali Barbecue. It is also the primary technology partner that so many of the guests have shared with us on this show. People like Sam, the cooking guy, Stacy Poonkinney, Jeff Alexander. So many times the guests tell us that they're using Toast when we didn't even know that going into the interview. That is why we are so grateful that they sponsor this show. We want you to win. You that listen to this show, we want you to improve your digital hospitality. Toast is built for restaurants and it's built for you. Toast is the restaurant first platform that's built for your needs, whatever your size, concept, or ambitions. Improve your bottom line with a customizable platform that's easy to learn, use, and grow with. And it meets you where you are with all the right tools for your price point. If you have any questions about Toast, please DM me at Sean P. Walchef, S-H-A-W-N-P-W-A-L-C-H-E-F. I will get you the link to the right Toast contact in your market. It's so important that if you listen to this show, that you win. We want you to be on this show eventually. Let us know that you heard the show, you heard about Toast, you implemented Toast, you did a Toast unboxing in your restaurant. Talk to us about how you've impacted your village, your city, your community. Share your Toast story with us. DM me today to learn more. And be sure to check out Toast.